Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here today. Hopefully you feel the same. If not, maybe I can change your mind before you leave today. But uh, also want to say thank you to everybody who's watching online, uh, whether live or later on. I want to say a special hello to my wife who's home with some sick kids. Uh, and Jenny, if you can just check in online with the people in the AV crew so we can confirm your attendance today, that would be perfect. <laughs> No, we're going to have fun today. We're going to be a little interactive, uh, both with those of you here, in addition to the interactivity we've already had, and also those of you online. So I'll give you a heads up on what's coming in just a bit. But um, definitely hoping my kids get better. Uh, they have bronchitis, and so it kind of sounds like the seal exhibit at the zoo at my house right now. And I had a, a kid come into the, the, end of the room uh, yesterday, or last night, and um, I thought it was the older one, but it turned out it was a younger one. I found out at the end of the, end of the night. But um, this one, he really likes to sleep with his knees in your back. Like that is the most comfortable position that he has. So it was a long night. I'm not going to say that I'm all here together mentally right now. Uh, so if I start saying something that doesn't make sense, somebody can just shout me down at your leisure. That would be great. But, uh, but I'm happy to be here. There's nowhere else I'd rather be. I'm happy to be here with you. And we are talking about better right now. And so we've been in this series, Better. And uh, we've taken as our theme Hebrews, which is a letter written to Christians, really helping uh, the Christians understand how Jesus is better, better than the law, better than Moses, better than the angels, better than the priesthood, better, in fact, than anything else they could choose to pursue, worship, prioritize, or build their life around. And so we'll get into that a little more. But sometimes, you know, we, we, we want something to be better, but it doesn't mean that we can always accomplish that. And I don't know if you guys heard this story, but it was relatively recent. There was a, an older lady who worked in a church in Spain, and she ran across uh, an ancient painting of Jesus. And I have a picture of it. An ancient painting of Jesus, I think it was from the Middle Ages. And she was trying to do the right thing. Uh, she wanted to improve the painting and restore it. So what she wanted was it for it to look something like this. But you know how it is when you try to improve something? Like maybe you try to even out your Christmas tree and you trim one side and you're like, wait a second, now I got to trim the other side. And then you go back and forth and then you barely have a Christmas tree left. Well, this lady, as she was continuing to try to restore the painting of Jesus, um, it did not get better. In fact, this is what it ended up looking like. Yeah, so the twist of the story is it was so bad that it became like a meme and started making the rounds. And now people actually travel as a tourist to this church just to look at this picture. And uh, of course, there's a lawsuit now between the lady who's trying to claim financial uh, responsibility for the, the church's new income from their, from their thing. Anyway, point being, sometimes you try to make things better. It doesn't work. Just, just something to make you laugh a little bit this morning, if that's okay. But we are actually uh, going to read Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, which if you've been following this series with us to date, you know this has been our theme scripture for the last three weeks, and it's going to continue to be our theme scripture today. So I want to go ahead and read that to you. It's the introduction to the book in the Bible called Hebrews. And uh, let's read this together. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And once again, the main point of this passage is simply to elevate Jesus to help the listeners and the readers understand how Jesus is superior, supreme, better than angels, prophets, everything, in fact, that came before and everything that they could choose to worship or pursue instead of Jesus. And it's saying Jesus is the son of the father. And so this is talking about Jesus, but it's talking about him in this broad context of the son of the father. And so in previous weeks, we've looked at how Jesus is the heir of all things. Then we looked at how Jesus is the one through whom the universe was made. Last week, we looked at how Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. And we delved really deeply into how, as a follower of God, everything is actually about God's glory. Now, we get to be the beneficiaries of that, but we want it to be that way, that everything is actually about God's glory. And so that was some deep waters we went into last week. But this week, I simply want to focus on the fourth of these seven phrases, and that is that Jesus, the Son, is the exact representation of the Father's being. 
And in, in other translations, it might have the word image, exact image of his being. So the idea here is, have you ever heard of, said about a son, like he's the spitting image of his father or maybe a daughter of a mother or a chip off the old block? That's the concept we're talking about here. The son matches the father, looks like the father. And it actually carries the connotation of uh, like a stamp. You know, if you have a stamp and then you stamp it, the stamp and what you stamped, should, the images should match exactly, right? Or a coin that you press. Like when they put George Washington's head on a coin, there's a mold for that. And the mold exactly matches what you see on the coin. And so the son is the exact representation or image of the father. And this idea of someone being in God's image, it may sound familiar to you if, you're, if you've been around church or you've read the Bible. And you can think, where else do you hear someone being made or someone who is in God's image? All the way back in Genesis, right? It says mankind, man and woman, are in God's image. And uh, so it's similar, but it's not exactly the same. Of course, because even though we do bear the image of God, in one sense, it's a not quite perfect image, would you say? Not a little bit tarnished or marred or flawed or blurry. But this passage, again, is saying Jesus, in Jesus, you can get the accurate, full picture, the representation, the image of the Father. Are you with me so far? And it's, it's pretty amazing. I mean, this is some, an idea that's uh, actually benefited us because much of our civilization is built on this premise that you are in the image of God. Therefore, you have rights and you have dignity and you have value. And the state can't even come, come in and just, you know, arrest you without due process. Like this actually impacts us in some very significant ways. But this idea of Jesus being the exact representation of the Father's, uh, of the father's being is, is actually pretty amazing because for one thing, there's been so many ideas throughout our world and throughout history about who God is. So you can think, for example, of uh, ancient Greek and Roman gods who were quite different than the picture of God in the Bible, right? They were oftentimes personification of parts of life like war or love or partying. And they were sometimes petty and even immoral and capricious. And they would just do things if they might look at people as just like a nuisance or something there for their entertainment. There's been ideas of gods in ancient tribal religions and even up till today where the gods are personifications of nature, like crops, lightning, thunder, you know, just parts of life and life experience. And again, these gods are often small, local. They don't have ultimate authority. But the picture of God in the Bible is very different than those. And it's very different, in fact, than almost every other religion that you could point to and say, what is the image of God there? So I want to read a very powerful scripture to you. This is from the book of Isaiah. And Isaiah chapters 40 through 66 is a large uh, chunk of uh, the book of Isaiah in scripture where it's just some of the, the grandest, most lyrical description of who God is. And so I want to read a lengthy passage. But again, this is to paint the picture of who this God is that Jesus is the exact representation of. Okay, so this is Isaiah uh, chapter 40. Starting in verse 12, if you want to read along in your Bible, you're welcome to do that. If you want to simply read along here, that's great as well. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket? Or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord? Or instruct the Lord as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him and taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Lebanon is not sufficient for altar fires, nor its animals enough for burnt offerings. Before him, God, all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. With whom then will you compare God? To what image will you liken him? As for an idol, a metal worker casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and fashions silver chains for it. A person too poor to present such an offering selects wood that will not rot. They look for a skilled worker to set up an idol that will not topple. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. 
No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal? Says the Holy One. So again, a profound truth about who God is. And you get the sense of the grandeur and the greatness and the holiness and the transcendence of God. And so you could forgive somebody for having trouble with the idea of how can that God that we just read about and described, how can that God be perfectly represented, accurately represented in a person? Because after all, we're, sometimes we can be pretty noble and pretty great, right? But, but maybe not all the times. Like we do some funny things. Like have you ever had to try to have a serious conversation and you just got hit with a, a bout of the hiccups? It's really hard to take someone's argument seriously when they're, when they're in the middle of hiccups. Or maybe you, you have a roommate or a spouse who, who snores. And if they do, don't look at them right now because you, you're just not fair to call them out. I saw a few of you making those looks. <laughs> we do some funny things. Um, you know, I don't know if you ever do this, but you ever walk into a room and you just forget why you were there. And then you have to decide, do I just stay here till I figure it out? Or do I go back? Even worse when you're in public and you're walking somewhere and you realize you're going the wrong way and you just have to randomly with no excuse turn around and go the other way. What I do is like try to check in my pockets like, oh, I left something, right? Just give yourself a little bit of cover so you can get out of there. Or here's one more trick. If you're ever like walking in public and you trip and you stumble, you just kind of run it out like you needed to start running, right? That's how you, if you see me doing that, that's not what it is, but giving away all my good secrets. So we're a little funny, but how could God the Father be represented in a human form? And so what I did this week was a little different, and I'm going to share it with you. Um, I actually read that whole chunk of scripture I referred to, Isaiah 40 through 66, because it's, it's one of the best examples of just a description, a lyrical description, amazing, of the transcendent, holy, totally other God. And then at the same time, or right afterwards, I I read the entire, skimmed the entire book of Luke because Luke is known as the gospel that is the most focused on the humanity of Jesus. And so Luke talks a lot about Jesus' emotions. It will actually tell you when he has an emotion, whereas some of the gospels, they don't necessarily do that. It just, it's implied, but it's not spoken. And then G Luke also talks about Jesus' blood, his sweat, and his tears, and more than any other gospel. And so Luke is a great, on the humanness of Jesus' side, Isaiah 40 through 66 is great on the transcendent holy God side. And I read both of these and I just tried to mentally overlay them. And what I saw was that the same themes were emerging in Isaiah 40 through 66, as well as in Luke. And so I'm gonna do something a little bit different today. I'm actually going to tell you what those five themes were. And in every case, I'm gonna read a passage from Isaiah 40 through 66 that kind of shows you how this is how the Father God is. And then I'm gonna just say, Remember that time that Jesus, and then fill in the blank, did something or said something, and that will be showing you how Jesus' heart and the Father's heart are the same, that Jesus, again, is the exact representation of the Father's being. Does that make sense? Yeah. And when I do the Jesus part, I'm just going to have a painting, and these are not pictures, and they're not accurate, so don't worry too much about that, but just a painting to help you visually to kind of think and focus your eyes on Jesus. Now, here's where the crowd participation comes in. I'm going to say a whole bunch of things that Jesus did and said, remember that time. But at the end of this message, right before we take communion, I'm going to ask you to have the same prompt. Remember that time. And then you can share something that you know Jesus did or said. You don't have to give the book and verse. You don't have to say your name. You don't have to preach a lesson. Just remember that time, Jesus, da-da-da-da-da. And we'll have some of that sharing right before we take communion together. Something about Jesus that shows you that he has the heart of the Father. Does that make sense? I'll give you another heads up when we get closer, right? You can even be distracted while I'm talking. I totally will not even be offended if you're thinking about this, okay? If you're distracted by something else, then that's on you. Okay, but thing number one about God and Jesus, God has authority and power over everything. So from Isaiah, but now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. 
God has authority and power over everything. And do you remember that time that there was a storm and the disciples were in the boat with Jesus and he was taking a nap and they were afraid for their lives and they went and woke him up. Lord, don't you care if we drown? And Jesus got up and rebuked the wind and the waves and stopped the storm. And his followers were amazed and terrified. Like, who does this? Who has authority over a storm? Do you remember that time that Jesus commandeered Peter's boat to teach people who were crowding him? And after he got done teaching, he told Peter, after a night full of fishing, he said, put your boat out, put your nets out again, you're going to catch some fish. And Peter said, Lord, we've, we've been doing this all night. There's no fish to be caught. And he said, no, go ahead and do it anyway. And Peter said, yeah, because you said so, I will. And he did, and he caught a haul of fish so big that they could barely get it into their boat. Do you remember that? Do you remember that time that a man was desperate to be healed and his friends helped him, and so they lowered him on a mat through the roof? And there was all kinds of people around uh, the man and the friends and Jesus. And Jesus said, son, your sins are forgiven. And he knew that people were thinking, who can... How dare this man forgive? Only God, the Father, can forgive. And he says, listen, for you guys, for you doubters, what's easier, to forgive sins or to tell someone they're healed? So he said, son, take up your mat and walk. You're healed. And the man got up and, and walked out. Jesus has authority and power over everything. Number two, God is completely unconcerned with our expectations of him. Just doesn't care. God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. In Isaiah 55. Now that's pretty humbling. God is completely unconcerned with what we think about him. And Jesus, Jesus, do you remember that time when he went back to his hometown of Nazareth? And he went into the synagogue and he read from the scroll of Isaiah. And he said, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And everybody was talking great things about Jesus, but he didn't stop there. And he went on and he said, surely you'll quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. I know you guys want me to do the miracles here that I, you, you heard I did in the other towns. And he says, but no prophet's accepted in his own town. And he goes on and he explains how God has always had a vision for people outside of just Israel. And the people get incensed and they try to kill him. Whereas minutes earlier, they were singing his praises. And Jesus didn't care. Do you remember that time when Jesus called Levi, Matthew, who was a tax collector? And Levi and Matthew, was, he, same guy, was so grateful that he, he threw a banquet. And Jesus came and ate. And people looked at him and said, why are you eating with tax collectors and sinners? And he came right back to him and he said, it's not the, it's not the righteous, you know, it's not the healthy who need a doctor. It's the sick. And do you remember when Jesus was challenged on the Sabbath and his, his followers picking grains on Sabbath and him healing somebody on Sabbath? And why aren't your people fasting? In every one of those cases, Jesus did not care what people expected of him and what their convictions tried to hem him in on. Jesus is unconcerned with what we expect of him. Number three, God is moved by our plight and interested in our well-being. From Isaiah, I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. God is moved by our plight and interested in our well-being. And Jesus, do you remember that time when Jesus encountered the leper who said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. A man who maybe experienced no touch, no human touch in any time in recent memory. And do you remember what Jesus did? He reached out and touched him. He said, I am willing, be clean. And do you remember the widow in Nain who was a part of her son's funeral procession walking down the street? And it says, when Jesus saw her, he was filled with compassion and he said, don't cry. And he reached out again with his hand and touched the coffin and raised that man. And do you remember 
Jairus, the synagogue leader, and his 12-year-old daughter who was at death's door. And Jairus came and said, Lord, please come heal, heal my daughter. And he was on his way, but he got interrupted by someone else who needed healing. And then when he finally got it on his way, they, people came and said, don't bother, she died. And Jesus said, don't be afraid. She's not, she's not dead, she's asleep. And people laughed at him. And Jesus went into the room and what did he do? He reached out and took her hand and said, little girl, get up. And she got up. Jesus is moved by our plight and he's interested in our well-being. Number four, God is utterly serious about holding us accountable for our response to the opportunities that he gives us. And sometimes it's simply a matter of changing our course and repenting. Like, do you remember the time when people came to Jesus and they were telling him about some people who a tragedy befell, Galileans? We don't understand all of it, but Jesus said, basically he made the point, said, listen, don't think that they were in a different situation than you. We're, we're, we're all walking a razor's edge. And he said, listen, unless you repent, you too will perish. And then he talks about a tower that had fallen on some people. And he says, same situation. Don't think that they were more unrighteous. It's not that. But you too need to repent or you will perish. Very serious about the opportunities that we have. Do you remember when he told the story of the servants, the three servants, and he gave 10 gold coins to one and five gold coins to one and one gold coin to one. And he said, do your thing, invest, invest for me. And one did, well done. And another did, well done. But the third took what he was given and buried it and hid it. Not a good situation. And that parable ended badly for that person. But Jesus, likewise, is utterly serious about what we do with the opportunities that he gives us. No, I'm not talking about Twitter. I literally want you to follow me. So sometimes we need to hear that, right? Number five, God is totally committed to loving us and acting in our best interests. This is the last one. And for this, I took Isaiah 53, which is actually um, an amazing passage, but it's about the suffering servant. And it's a prophecy that Jesus, in fact, fulfilled. So this, I would say, simultaneously fills talking about God the Father's heart and what Jesus actually fulfilled. But about that Messiah, about that servant, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. God is ultimately committed to loving us and acting in our best interests. The Son is utterly committed to loving us and acting in our best interests. And I could give you some remember that times, but I'm actually going to hold off because I want to let you have some of them. And so, again, this is coming in a few minutes. You can be thinking, what is something that I've read or heard that Jesus did or said for, him, for me that helps me understand the heart of the Father, how Jesus is the exact representation of his being? But you know, this is amazing. There's this interaction in John 14 where one of Jesus' followers is talking to him. And I wanna, I wanna bring that up to you. It's, uh, his name is Philip. And, and Philip says to Jesus, this is before the crucifixion. He says, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? Jesus is the exact representation of the Father's being. He is in fact better than anything else you can pursue or prioritize or build your life around. And that's great. But we gotta make this a little more personal.
Because it's one thing to say, Jesus is better, thing, better than anything else you can pursue, prioritize, or build your life around. But ultimately, it's got to come down to a personal question. And that is, are you pursuing him, prioritizing him, and building your life around? And I don't mean just in a theoretical way, like because this comes down to actually how we live on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis, right? Your moods. Right. Nobody has moods, I'm sure. Your habits. Your ways of going about your day and your week. How do, you, how do you look at your checkbook as it relates to God? How do you look at the use of your time as it relates to God? How do you look at your interactions with your spouse and your kids as it relates to God? Man, that's a, that's a high calling for me every single day. I mean, that's where I live. And you can ask yourself, are you doing that? It's a question for you because no one else can, can cast the final judgment on that. You have to self-reflect and answer that for yourself. If you believe that Jesus is better, if you believe that he's supreme, is it reflected in your every part of your life, your personal life, your family? Again, your spouse, your friends, your roommate, your work life. Do you put it all on the altar and say, God, this is, this is not mine. This is yours. So please tell me, you know, I want to do my best. At the same time, I don't want to worship my career. So how do I do this in the intimate, everyday parts of your life? And you got to ask yourself this question from time to time, because the fact is, we all get dull and rusty. We all get lazy. I mean, maybe someone can raise their hand if they feel like they've never gotten dull, rusty, or lazy. I can't do it. And we need to hear those words in Revelation 3, where Jesus says, look, if anyone opens a door, I'm here knocking, like, I'll come in and eat with you. But those I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Those are words written to Christians. We all need to hear it. We all need to be able to self-reflect and ask that question. And so this morning, I want you to even just think about one. I'm going to specific, be a little more specific and narrow and just focus this down. Because this, is, this, this can be hard to do. But I want to ask you just this simple question. Even with how you came here this morning, let's just all focus on one thing. How you came here this morning, was it something that you did that you thought, man, in every way, God, I want this to be something that honors you. When I think about coming to church, because let's be honest, God works all the time in all situations, but this is a pretty special thing for God that we all get together collectively on a Sunday. And there's so many things that God does behind the scenes, conversations that happen, um, meeting new people, reconnecting with friends, encouragement. You know, people come in here and they're, you know, sometimes it's you, sometimes it's someone else, but you're on your you need, you need each other. That's why we're here. And so I'm asking you, how did you come here this morning? And this is not, to make, this is not a guilt trip. And, and if, you, if you came in here off the street or this is your first time here, this, this particular challenge isn't necessarily for you. And also, if you're coming in here and you're just, man, you're at the end of your rope and you've just tied a knot and you're hanging on, cool. Like, we're just happy you're here, honestly. But I'm talking about those of us who are doing okay, just day to day, we're fine. But how did you do that? Were you thinking, were you praying, God, who do you want me to encourage today? Who do you want me to look in the eyes? What, what spirit and attitude am I bringing you? Because I guarantee you, your spirit and attitude affects everybody else here. It really does. And so that's the question for you. Think about it. Pray about it. And you might say, well, this is just some small thing. Maybe, maybe, but I've, I've watched humans for a while, and one thing I've noticed is what you do in one area almost always is connected with what you do in other areas. And so if you prioritize God and God's priorities and values highly in one area, you are very likely to do that in many other areas. And if you don't prioritize God and his values in one area, more than likely, just I'm a statistics person, okay, more than likely... You may not in other areas too. So I want you to think about that. If the shoe doesn't fit, don't wear it. If the shoe fits, you know, you know how that ends. But I want to ask you that. I want to ask you to investigate your heart on that and make a decision next week if you need to change something. Maybe it's 180 degrees. Maybe it's 20 degrees. But assign value, like we talked about, and align your actions to that value. Decide and then orient yourself in the direction you've decided to face. That's the challenge for this week. 
Jesus is the exact representation of the Father's being. So now we're to that point where I'm gonna ask you, and I need some helpers here with some microphones. I'm not sure where they went. Okay, we've got one here and one here. So you're in your mind, you're thinking in one here. Okay, so we've got a few mics. If you have something you'd like to share, you raise it, and here's the prompt. Here's the prompt, and we're gonna take communion after we do this. Remember that time Jesus, and then you can say said, or what something he did, and it's something that connects you, that you see that Jesus was reflecting the heart of the Father. Okay, and we'll have just a few minutes of this. Remember the time that Jesus resisted all temptation for us, especially in the wilderness, so that he could be the perfect, unblemished sacrifice for our sins. Remember the time after Jesus had died and was resurrected, and the two men were walking from Emmaus, and they were crushed. And Jesus appeared to them, and he opened their eyes through the scriptures, and they went back to the disciples, praising God. Yeah, remember the time when... Lazarus died, Jesus' close friend, and he wept. And it just reminds me that God has compassion for humanity and for the personal relationships that we have in our own lives. When Jesus and God were inaugurating the kingdom in that passage, Paul, you mentioned in Luke 4, Jesus knew very well what God's intention was from that passage in Isaiah to preach the good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim freedom to the captives, release for the prisoners, comfort those who mourn, bestow on them a crown of beauty, oil of gladness, and a garment of praise instead of despair. And they'll be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Yeah. Uh, that Jesus forgave Peter after uh, he disowned him three times and forgave him and loved him. Remember the time that Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Thank you guys so much. Um, we can continue to reflect on this, but this time we're going to go ahead and pray and take communion together. Lord, uh, we want to honor you. Amazing to just try to understand who you are and give you the proper place that you deserve, as well as your son. Uh, I pray that right now and throughout the week we can reflect and, and focus our attention and energy on um, admiration, honor, respect, worship, that he's the exact representation of your being, and orient our lives uh, in accordance with that. And we thank you for this opportunity to take the bread and the juice and remember Jesus. Amen.